Hello, everyone. Welcome. I am Mitsu Rajda, Chair Program Committee. Today's meeting is about impasse in mediation. How do we get how did we get there and how do we get out? Our presenter is Peter Phillips, who is ever gracious and helpful. Peter has done over 200 mediations and arbitrations concentrating in general commercial franchise employment insurance and securities. He is the director of ADR skills program and distinguished adjunct professor, New York Law School. Uh, he took, he got his ADR training from Strauss Institute for Dis uh, Dispute Resolution, Pepperdine University School of Law, CPR Institute, FINRA, ICC, ABA, Chartered Institute of uh, Arbitrators. He is affiliated with ABA uh, Business Law Section, former Chair ADR Committee and Dispute Resolution Section. Justice uh, Garibaldi, American Inn of Court for uh, Alternative Dispute Resolution, New Jersey Association of Professional Mediators, of course, uh, Union International Day Advocates World Mediation Forum. I, I know I'm not pronoun pronouncing it right. Uh, he has, he's a writer and co-director of award-winning films on mediating corporate and, uh, corporate and community conflict, conflicts. He's an author, editor, uh, and chapter contributor to six books and numerous articles and monographs. He, he is a guest lecturer at Fordham University School of Law, and NY, NYU School of Law, Columbia Law School, Cardozo School of Law, Pepperdine University, and many more. Uh, he is an invited speaker at numerous international conferences uh, at Geneva, uh, Buenos Aires, Moscow, Beijing, Hong Kong, Chamonix, Shanghai, Paris, London, Warsaw, uh, Lagos, Dubai, and many other places. Uh, he is the senior vice president and interim president CPR Institute. Uh, he was the litigation associate associate at uh, Schultz, Roth, and Isabel, and, and Cahill Gordon, and Raindell. He got his law degree from New York Law School. Uh, he's also a professional actor and director. He got his diploma from the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. So I inv invite Peter uh, to please begin your presentation. Take it over. Take over. Thank you very much, Mitsu. Uh, and thank you uh, very much, uh, Alan, for the expertise that you're pouring into the uh, association. It's, uh, it's an exciting thing. This is the first time, actually, that I have taken part in a Zoom uh, platform uh, presentation. I uh, feel that everything is going to go well because we're in your hands, and I have no idea whatsoever what I'm doing. So. On that basis, I'm ready to go. Um, when I was approached to uh, speak on this topic, I explained to Mitsu that uh, I have mediated a lot, but nothing like the amount that many people in the association have mediated. And I have seen my share of impasse, but again, I have a, a feeling that there are people who are participating in this presentation, who have a great deal more to contribute in terms of their own experiences than I have. So I have asked Alan, um, please to arrange that, you know, it, it'll soon get to a point that I'll say, has anyone had an experience like that? Or does anyone have anything that they could share about uh, what it's like to be confronted with this impasse situation. I hope no one will be shy. Um, if it turns out that no one is led to uh, join and, and participate, or that somehow technically it's too difficult for people to join and participate, then I assure you that this will be a very short presentation indeed. So, 
I uh, not only welcome your your input, but I sort of rely on it, I guess. Uh, the way that I'd like to structure the uh, presentation is this. First, I'd like to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what we're talking about. Um, impasse, genuine impasse, is different from somebody walking out or someone uh, uh, stating an ultimatum or uh, having an emotional uh, rant. An impasse is, is, uh, is an entirely unique animal, and I would like to make sure that we all share an understanding of what the term means and what it feels like in the room when it happens. I'd like to spend some time talking about what causes impasse. There are some of the causes of impasse that a mediator could control. Uh, there are other causes of impasse that leave a mediator sort of outside the tent. And I think it's important as sophisticated practitioners that we understand that we don't have a magic wand and there are certain things that we can do and, and other things that we can't as a function of what caused the impasse. Then I would in fact like to address those questions. What are the mediator's powers with respect to impasse? What are the limitations of the mediator's powers when it comes to that? And in the event that you really do want to kind of push against the envelope, what risks does a mediator encounter when she attempts aggressively to assist the parties over the hump of impasse? That leads us to a few ethical considerations that probably are familiar, but I would, I think we might benefit from raising them in this context too. Uh, it, it, it's, it, I have found it challenging to know when to stop for fear of going over that dotted line and into an area that professionally has ethical uh, quicksand in it. Uh, and then we'll sum up and then, and then we'll go out and eat, or in my case, go downstairs and eat. Okay, so what is uh, impasse? It is when the parties have stopped moving and that's distinct from when one party is expecting a counter offer from the other and isn't getting it. Uh, it's different from uh, someone who's saying that this is their last, best, and final offer because that too is often a, a strategic gesture rather than a, a, a genuine impasse. Uh, the, the halt in the communication and in the bidding is not strategic. It's when someone actually is ready to go ahead and light the fuse and blow the place up, that one or both parties uh, is in a state where they believe that the negotiation has ceased. Uh, and our, the recent decision of the, the congressional leaders is, I think, a, a, a good example of that. Uh, there were strategic risks to declaring that impasse, but it's the declaration of the impasse, the, the statement that there will be no more exchange of uh, offer and bid. That's what we're talking about. I often recognize impasse because I don't feel well. Uh, it's when uh, sort of the bottom falls out from, from my stomach and I realize I don't have anything left in, in my cards. Uh, and I feel, um, well, I feel I should have, I should have stuck with my J, day job or I, I, I should have stayed in bed or had the flu. Uh, I find it vaguely embarrassing. I have a sense that, uh, they're all looking at me and thinking that I'm incompetent. Uh, impasse 
I often recognize bec because of the way I feel in the room. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of energy and I don't have a lot of creativity. And I guess I get a little uh, uh, scared or a little more than apprehensive. I, I get a little scared uh, professionally. Again, it's not a walkout. I had a mediation last month where the parties met pursuant to a, a rule 140 mediation. It took many months to get them to, to agree to come to the room. I, after the joint session, I spent 20 minutes or so with the claimant. It was an employment uh, situation. And the claimant was asking for several hundred thousand dollars. I went into the room with the employer and uh, I said, uh, I offered to shake his hand and he declined. And I said, had I done anything to, um, to upset him or irritate him? And he said, no, I have enough friends. I didn't come here to make friends. Tell me where they are. And I said, well, he, you know, he wants, he wants a lot of money. And he stood up and said, that's it, screw you. And he left. Now, that's not impasse. <laughs> It's a tantrum or it's a walkout, but it's something that, that over which I had completely no control. It was utterly unilateral. You know, it didn't have anything to do with my skills or my perceptions were inapplicable. You know what I mean? He, he, just, he just left. So uh, I didn't call after him. I, I uh, perceived that this was a negotiation that was not going to take place, and it didn't. That's different from impasse. Now, there are three main um, causes, I think, or categories of causes uh, for impasse. Uh, almost never is impasse caused uh, by what you see on the screen now where you have uh, two parties, they're equally informed, they're equally competently represented by counsel, they have a shared understanding of what happened, um, and they have basic disagreements on either how the law is going to come out or the amount of money that's at stake. It frequently happens, it, you know, well, let, take it in two pieces, the liability side and the damages side. On the liability side, you have counsel who disagree whether the statute is told during a certain period of time or it isn't, or whether a, a, um, uh, a, a particular common law cause of action applies to people who are independent contractors as opposed to employees. In franchise, for instance, there's often, I think, a genuine question in some claimant's counsel's mind about the likelihood of what would happen at summary judgment or at a motion to dismiss even, if the question is, this violation of the statute is applicable only to an employee I think my guy's an employee. The franchisor thinks my guy is an independent contractor. That's a, that's a difference with respect to what constitutes an independent contractor. No one's arguing about anything other than their understanding of the law. And as I say, if you have two, you could have two sophisticated attorneys who have a good faith difference with respect to that, and it could result in impasse. Another is a, a simple, difference with respect to whether punitives are offered or whether treble damages are offered or whether uh, efforts to um, look for other work should be re reduced from a, from a tort claim. Uh, they have, they're, they're not ignorant of the damages. They all share an understanding of the facts that give rise to damages, but they have a difference 
a view with respect to the value of the case, not based on a difference in fact, but a difference in law. Never happens. Never happens. And it's a shame because, uh, you know, this is what you learn when you go to, to you know, mediator training and all this sort of thing. This, this is what you think is going to happen. It never happens. I, I don't think there is ever such a thing, for one thing, as equally informed clients or equally well-represented clients. And people do have different views as to whether it happened on a Thursday or a Friday or whether it was raining when the car uh, hit the post or it wasn't raining when the car hit the post. And they'll argue about that. And um, that gives mediators an opportunity to talk about, well, what's the risk that somebody would, you know, that a jury would find the other way. That, in other words, there's a lot more elbow room or breathing room there. Uh, it very seldom happens that both parties and both counsel agree on what happened and disagree on the law. More frequent is impasse that's caused by incompatible interests. Uh, Dad left me that armchair. No. Dad left me that armchair. I don't want anything in the estate except for that armchair. I don't want anything in the estate except for that armchair. I won't accept anything. The armchair is the only thing that we're here talking about. Uh, that is a, a, a boiled down and maybe a little bit silly uh, example of incompatible interests. Uh, situations that are genuinely and sincerely zero sum. The reason we're arguing is to find out who gets the armchair. Somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. Those disputes uh, are susceptible to impasse by virtue of people not having a plan B. Mutual mistrust. Um, Often this doesn't happen, at least in, in my experience, for four or five hours into the mediation. But pretty soon you realize that really there's nothing that the other person could promise by way of an outcome. Because the counterparty is convinced that that promise uh, won't be fulfilled. Uh, there's nothing that the person can say because there's nothing that the other guy will believe. The mistrust is so profound uh, and, and the opportunity to, to require someone to perform is so tenuous that it's mutual mistrust between the parties that ultimately uh, causes impasse. And I mean, it just, stops. That's similar to an antagonistic predisposition. And, and into this category, which is a pretty big category, as you can see, these four categories get bigger and bigger as we go on. Um, is someone who just finds the other guy um, not just distrustful, but uh, irritating, obnoxious, aggressive, belligerent, uh, unpleasant, uh, Th that the only thing, he only wants one thing and he wants that guy out or he, he, wants, he wants him out of the room or he can't stand to be with him anymore. Uh, that too ends up with binary outcomes. Uh, either what I want happens or nothing happens. So you have that fixed pie bias. I, and, you, and I as a mediator often don't perceive that until a certain amount of time has taken place and people really do start to act irrationally towards each other. And they, when, they're, when I ask them to explain why they're doing what they're doing, they talk in emotional and uh, terminal kind of language. That's because uh, of uh, an antagonism between the parties that's so strong that it even trumps out their own interests. Uh, they, um, there isn't any outcome 
that's satisfactory to them because it's an outcome that necessarily would engage the other side. Finally, and this happens when insurance companies are involved, when other indemnitors are involved, when a third party funder is involved in the, in the case, somebody, that, usually the person who actually has the checkbook is not in the room. Uh, I try to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, during the time that I spend talking to the parties prior to the mediation itself. But best laid plans, <laughs> you, you don't realize until about 12.30 or one o'clock in the afternoon that all this time, uh, the defendant isn't the one who has the checkbook. It's the defendant's aunt, or it's the defendant's indemnitor, or it's the defendant's partner, business partner, or as, as often is the case, the property casualty insurer. Uh, it's a key stakeholder in the outcome, and they're absent. Sometimes, by the way, and, and I don't do family law, and I'd love to know from some people in a minute whether this happens. Sometimes it's a spouse or a brother. Uh, sometimes it's somebody who the party who's in the room is wary of, of looking bad in front of. I, I had one like that it, it, there too. It was, an, it was an employment discrimination case. And it became clear that the claimant was being given an offer that in any analysis was really favorable. I mean, really much more valuable than continuing the litigation. The trouble is that he was unwilling to go back to his wife and say, I settled for X because he was afraid that she would think that he's a wuss, uh, that, he, that he didn't stick up for himself. She wasn't in the room. She wasn't part of the decision making. And uh, we weren't able to close that deal. Uh, I just want to mention a few more, and then I would like very much for people to share their perceptions, either you know along the lines of what I'm suggesting, or other causes of, for impasse that you've experienced. Um, th there are a lot of emotional barriers, but the two that I've uh, chosen to to bring up tonight, uh, I think, are the most common ones. One of them is when someone needs vindication and, and there I'm talking about what they need themselves. They need for somebody to say you were unjustly dealt with or uh, you, uh, um, you deserve an apology. Um, I, was, I was wrong and you were right. Uh, they need to hear that, um, that it, it, on some level of fairness or justice, uh, they have been vindicated. Uh, I find that difficult to deal with myself. And uh, I guess if I were a more, you know, if I were a nicer guy, I would be a more effective mediator in that respect. I can't do that. And I, and I can't arrange for the other person to do that. Uh, I, I sometimes will remind people that courts can't do that, that there is no assurance at all that the outcome of adjudicated cases, whether in arbitration or in court, will be just or will be fair or will be worth it. Uh, I sometimes try to get through that uh, with a, a sort of an anecdote by saying, look, uh, you're about to go on an important job interview. You bought beautiful shoes. You have a new suit. You're walking down the street and you, and you step in dog shit. And you could say, there's a law against this. I'm going to find whose dog this is. I'm going to make them wish they'd never lived. Uh, I'm going to make sure that this kind of stuff doesn't happen anymore. This is wrong. Or, in light of the fact that the interview is coming up, you could get a stick 
scrape it off the bottom of the shoe and go on with your life. Now that doesn't mean that the person with the dog has been corrected, but it does mean that you're not burdened with that kind of anger and resentment when you go into the job interview. And the question is what's best for you? Uh, a lot of people smile and nod their head and then they completely ignore me and they go right on with their desire for vindication. And, you know, I, I talk about limits of mediation. The other, uh, what I'm calling an emotional barrier is uh, other directed. The, the first, the desire for vindication has to do with me. I want people to, tell, to say that I was right. The other one has to do with, I want you to eat dirt. You've hurt me, you've hurt other people. You need to be punished and I'm the agent to punish you. I'm going to keep this going until you wish you'd never been born. Uh, I need for you to get hurt as badly as I've been hurt. Uh, I think anybody who's mediated 10 cases has, has seen that. Frequently, it's something that through our tools of empathy and, and um, probing through alternatives and a lot of the things we do as mediators, frequently we can get on the other side of that. Sometimes we can't. A good friend of mine was in a contested divorce for six and a half years. And the day came that she went to court for the final declaration of divorce. She received the order, everyone signed it, everyone acknowledged it. Uh, there were no more issues to be resolved. Uh, and she said she went to the uh, parking lot to get in her car and go home. And she suddenly, realized that she didn't have that anymore. That for all these years, she, some part of her, a major part of her was defined by this dispute. And uh, she didn't know what to do with herself. She, did, she didn't know, uh, she didn't know how to, where, where was she going to drive to? What was she going to do? Because she didn't have this anymore. She had defined herself by this conflict. Uh, in extreme cases, I think we sometimes work with people who, as much as they hate it, need the conflict that they're engaged in and they're reluctant to let it go. There are other cognitive barriers. Uh, I'm, by the way, I'm gonna be talking about emotional barriers, cognitive barriers, and, and what I call merits barriers. Uh, we've all, I think, pretty familiar with this uh, cognitive barriers. Reactive devaluation is the reason God made mediators. Reactive devaluation means that a party will react to information differently, depending on who's providing the information. If the husband says it's raining outside, the wife might well say, so you say, you've said that too much, I'm tired of listening to you. Whereas if the mediator says it's raining outside, the wife might say, I'd better get an umbrella. Uh, I think we've all seen this, but reactive devaluation sometimes can be the seed of uh, an impasse situation. And there, if, if we're literate enough to say that that's what's going on, we're good at that. That's, that's why we do it. We, uh, a lot of the value that we add to a, a dispute resolution process is being the guy for reactive devaluation, being the person who can convey uh, information 
without its being devalued because we're trusted and the person that's really coming from is not trusted. Another one is an aversion to loss or an aversion to the unfamiliar. Loss aversion, I think everybody is familiar with and they've talked, written about it, talked about it quite a bit. An aversion to the unfamiliar, I think, is, is less frequently uh, brought to light. If you ask people to go into a different business arrangement or to go into an arrangement with different people or to be, go into a different state or to use different data, uh, it's uncomfortable. And they'd rather not do that uh, than take the possibility of, of reaping a reward from it. Uh, I, I tried to get along well in the sandbox and when Mitsu said, uh, would you do this in the law center? I said, I sure will. And then she called back a few days later and said, well, actually, would you do it online? And, you know, from the neck up, I said, of course, Mitsu, I'll, I'll do whatever it is you want. I, and from the neck down, I was, I would rather die than do that. I, I have no competency in it. Uh, I'm going to be looking at this piece of glass. Uh, I hate this. Um, now, since we're actually doing it, I'm going to stay neck up, but I use it as an illustration of how some parties uh, are really reluctant to go into an area that may be very attractive in theory, but it's one that places them in an, in an unfamiliar environment. Uh, before I go on, uh, I wonder, has anything I said, um, you know, pushed any buttons? And, and, and I wonder if anybody can maybe tell a brief war story uh, that m m might help to take this across. I think there are people here who've mediated a lot more than I have, and um, I think we could all learn from them. What do they do, Alan? They hit chat. Uh, yes, if ever, anybody that wants to speak, type into chat and I will unmute you. So just say in chat, unmute me or something, right? Right. Or I want to talk. Or please. Depends how polite you want to be. Or like, you know, shut that guy up. Okay, we've got Andrew Smith. Oh, unmute. I like, oh, Andrew, talk to us. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. One thing that comes to mind with respect to revenge is a vacation I had a couple of years ago where this person, uh, I guess pretty wealthy, he wanted a boat to be built for his family to enjoy during the summer. However, the because um, the person did not deliver the boat until late October. And so he missed out on the summer, the warm weather, his family on the boat. Of course, he sued him. And we had a pretty decent settlement on the table, but he refused to settle because he wanted the guy to pay because he missed out on a very important time of his life. He missed his boat for that particular summer and he just would not settle no if, ands, or buts about it because he wanted him to pay. He wanted revenge and nothing else would do. And well, asked, why, would, why would the guy paying give him back his summer? Well, because the boat wasn't prepared when he had committed to provide the boat. The boat was actually due to be delivered by May. And no, 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 I get that. What I mean is, uh, if he want, if, if what he missed was his summer, exactly. why would the guy paying uh, address that? How he addressed that? Um, he addressed it that he just would not settle, no ifs, ands, or buts. He wanted the guy to, to suffer because he made his, him he made his family suffer, he made him suffer, and that they did not have to pleasure up the boat for that summer. Yep, yep. And, and what was interesting about this case is he had connection with the law firm that represented him. He said, well, look, I just paid the law firm a uh, set rate for the year and I don't have to settle if Andrew puts about it. I want this guy to pay. And so there were no transaction costs involved. Exactly. That's ugly. Presumably we're talking impasse here, right? 
definitely. <laughs> definitely. Anybody else? Well, let me go on. We get to the merits now. Um, it's very difficult uh, when someone lacks factual information that the other party has and will not accept it from the other party or will not believe it from the other party. And there are cases, particularly in pro se cases, uh, or a, a case where one, one counsel is, is not diligent, that they haven't done enough discovery, they haven't done enough, uh, they, they don't understand that there are dispositive facts that took place, uh, but it doesn't stop them. Uh, they go ahead and persist and uh, rely upon the, uh, the information, the, the poor or inadequate information they're dealt with. That's a frequent cause of, of uh, impasse to me. Uh, and then we get to one of my favorites, which is just a flawed assessment process. Uh, a smart lawyer with an intelligent counsel with excellent communication um, says that uh, she thinks that she has a 65 to 70 percent chance of winning this case in front of a jury. And in the other room, you realize that the other side, equally competent, believes that they have a 70% chance of winning in front of the jury. So you have a nonsense going on. You have 140% worth of assurance happening. This is called over-optimism, okay? And um, lawyers are prone to it, much more than clients. Uh, lawyers make more mistakes than uh, weathermen, even though, they have more information than weathermen, and even though uh, weathermen don't get, uh, you know, monetarily hurt when they're wrong, and lawyers do get hurt when they're wrong, nevertheless, they're wrong more frequently than meteorologists, okay? Uh, why? What are the things that, as a mediator, I can watch and see happening? Uh, is it mere assertion of ego? Not always. It is sometimes. Uh, but you have people who have selective perception, uh, who concentrate on what it is they're doing, or the argument they're making, or the logic that they're trying to convey to you, and just hopping over other things that are happening uh, right in the room. About uh, 20 minutes before we started. Uh, tonight. Alan and I were doing adjustments and figuring out what the, um, you know, how, how the camera worked and all that sort of thing. And his damn dog started to yap and yip and yip and yap and yip and yip. And I didn't understand what he was trying to say. And I couldn't hear what he was saying. And then Alan said, luckily, the dog isn't too loud. And, and he kept on working. Okay, now, that to me is selective perception, all right? He's so concentrated on what he's doing that he's not in a position accurately to perceive that the dog actually is disrupting the mic, you know? The dog's making a sharper sound than, than Alan was. It was so like the perception, and it happened as a cognitive function, not as a choice. It's, it, I, I do the same thing, we all do the same thing, we're hardwired, okay? It's the nature of, of focus to exclude other information. Um, when that happens to a large degree, that can, be, that can result in a dead end. It can result in impasse, all right? The second one I wanted to point out is confirmation bias. Um, confirmation bias means, again, totally hardwired. It isn't anything that we can control. It's something that as mediators we can see in other people, but it isn't something that as people we ourselves can control. It's a tendency to accept information that confirms our hypothesis. 
and to prefer it to information that doesn't. Uh, the anecdote that I have on that is something that my wife and I experienced, oh, it was like 20 years ago. I live in Montclair, and there was a Saturday morning I was doing errands. And this particular Saturday morning, I, I had a lot of near misses. I had um, uh, some pedestrians talking on the phone that weren't looking up. I had uh, people who were uh, slow driving, like five, eight miles an hour, uh, looking for addresses and things like that. There were a lot of, and in each case, the person who was involved was a woman. And I came home and I said, Elaine, do you think that um, women are less attentive than men? Do you, do you think that um, there are poorer drivers or, or more reckless pedestrians or something like that by virtue of something of, about women? Because I, I've, had the, I've had the observation, you know, that at least today, there are a lot of women who just aren't paying attention. How dare you say that? That's ridiculous. You know, it's sexist. It's offensive. Uh, there's absolutely no data to back that up. It just comes out of, you know, your own misogynist uh, predisposition. Would you believe the next morning, okay, Sunday, the Star Ledger had an article in, the, in, in one of the neighborhood sections about women drivers, about the difference between women and men drivers. And it was a report that had come from the, from the state traffic people or something like that. And I read this article and I went, this is fantastic. This is exactly what I'm talking about. So she was still in bed. I went upstairs and I, and I showed her the article. I said, read this. She read the article and she said, told you so. Okay. She, <laughs> she had read in that article information that confirmed her understanding. I had read the article and I had seen the information that confirmed my understanding. This is called confirmation bias and it's nobody's fault, okay? It's helpful as mediators for us to see it. It, instead of you know not knowing what's happening in the room, uh, watching selective perception, watching reactive devaluation, watching confirmation bias adds to our ability to um, insert a certain amount of perception of value that people who are not so trained or who, who aren't as literate as, as mediators are uh, might be able to reframe what's happening, not as impasse, but as the result of a cognitive, uh, a cognitive flaw, I guess you'd call it, and over-optimism, uh, which I dealt with before. There are only two others. Um, reputational concerns. I think impasse happens when a party having investigated in the course of the mediation what options there were, realizes that there is no option that will protect her from reputational concerns. Um, the most obvious to me, because I mainly do commercial work, is uh, the idea that settling this will attract other claims. I once uh, worked with a guy named Hans Peter Frick, who uh, was general counsel of Nestle in Vevey, Switzerland. And he had a false advertising claim involving, I think it was Poland spring water. And the allegation was that not every bottle sold globally contained only water from Poland spring, Maine. Some of the water came from other sources, other springs. Now, he went into mediation on that, but he didn't stay more than three or four hours because he realized that any resolution of that claim, which was brought, I think, by a German um, attorney 
on behalf of a German uh, claimant. No resolution of that claim on behalf of the, you know, that favored the claimant could, could possibly avoid is receiving similar claims from the other 178 jurisdictions that uh, Nestle does business in all over the world. There, is, there wasn't a way that he could frame an outcome that would not attach to Nestle's reputation, the understanding whether true or false, that any claim respecting false advertising or in particular, Poland spring water, uh, you'd probably get some money for. And the only way that he knew as a matter of business to prevent that risk was to say, see you in court and walk out. He came to an impasse because of his reputational concerns, not because the litigation made sense, not because he, he wanted to avoid spending more money than it's worth. He could get out of it, you know, probably for, <laughs> he could probably get out of it for a hundred euros, you know, a hundred thousand euros. It, it was not a big deal, uh, it, but it was a big deal with respect to Nestle's reputation. And finally, I want to talk about flawed decision analysis. It, it's the topic actually of a whole evening, and it's a fun topic of how decision trees are made and how people make decisions. Uh, and, and it hinges uh, as a matter of just, you know, uh, as, as a tool, decision analysis has to do with what is the amount at stake and what is the percentage probability that you're gonna make it. In other words, if you're looking for a hundred bucks and, and you think you have a 50% chance of getting that hundred bucks, then anybody who offers $50, you'd better take it. Anybody who offers $51 and you turn it down, you're an idiot. So, so, the, so it's just a question of making sure that you know what the value of the claim is today, not the value of the claim down the line, all right? And an example of this, I don't know if you, who on the line is as old as I am, but during the Iran hostage crisis, um, the Department of Defense proposed to President Carter a six-step way to go in and get the hostages out of where they were being held in Tehran. And it required, you know, the, uh, helicopters to leave from uh, a flight deck of an aircraft carrier and go to a remote area, and then from a remote area transfer to other vehicles. And, those vehicles would then enter and then there would be an extraction and then they'd go back and, you know, there was, so there were six stages to this thing. And Carter said, what's the likelihood that it's going to work? And the generals told him each stage has a 92% chance, 92% probability it's going to work. President's 92% probability, that's great. I'm in there, going to do it. And if you remember, what happened was that on the second stage, when the helicopters landed, they all got sand in their engines and the thing aborted and, and none of the prisoners was uh, relieved and two of the soldiers were killed. And that happened because of poor decision making. A 92% chance in the first stage means that in the second stage, there's an 84% chance. And on the third stage, there's a 72% chance. And by the time you get to the sixth stage, the, the increasing uh, improbability becomes dominant. And it becomes clear there's less than a 50% likelihood that this is going to happen. So that happens a lot with lawyers in mediation. I can say to them, well, you know, what's your claim? What, what would be a home run at trial? $10,000. Well, and, and what's the likelihood you're going to survive summary judgment? 90%. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. We're all lawyers. <laughs> you can't say that. 75%. Okay, so if you want 100,000 and there's a 75% chance that 
and then it's going to cost you if 75 percent chance that means it's worth 75 is going to cost you 15 to do the motion that means sixty thousand dollars this morning if, if if they could write out a check for sixty thousand that's a hundred cents on the dollar right what do you mean what do you mean what, what are you trying to pull what, what are you what are you trying to say to me okay <laughs> the, the 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 effort of the mediator to try to assist people in accurate decision analysis uh, is sometimes resented and i think it's never a hundred percent adopted but you can see in impasse situations very, very frequently uh, an inability of the decision maker to make to use simple decision analysis arithmetic. Um, I don't know what to do about that other than, than to try to slowly talk people into it. And sometimes I take the client out of the room so the lawyer doesn't look like completely stupid in front of his client and we go through it together. Sometimes I do it with both counsel, but neither of the clients and the counsel can put in their own probability numbers. And they'll see that, they, that by the time you come to the end of it, they're not very far off. Um, that process uh, and the inability to perform that process is, is uh, I think, a serious cause of impasse. Thanks. Can I ask again? Um, so far, uh, uh, can anyone, based on some of the stuff that I've tried to relate, does that make sense to people? By the way, you get to say, I don't know what you're talking about. That sort of thing has never happened in a room that I'm involved in as, <laughs> as a mediator. But I, I wonder again whether I could solicit some responses from, from the group in terms of their experience. I'd like to talk about the mediator's powers and the limitations of the mediator's powers. Um, without question, I think the greatest power that the mediator has is perseverance. Um, I have learned to take the advice of, of much more experienced mediators than I and never stop. I have to be told to stop. Um, I'm the only one in the room who believes in the settlement, who's an advocate for the settlement. And uh, I don't think it's appropriate for me to relinquish that. Uh, I will do what they tell me to, but I will always be there and I will always probe. Another thing that I have found helpful is uh, to admit uh, to admit right then, you know, put right on the table that I have played my last card, uh, that I don't have something wise and perceptive to say right now. Uh, I can say, you seem to be very par far apart. Uh, I don't hear in any of you suggestions uh, of how to move forward. Uh, I would like to ask your help. Uh, for any thoughts that you have about how this thing might get back on its feet. And then I shut up. Now that silence might continue until it's broken, but it's not going to get broken by me. I, I mean it when I say I would like to hear from the parties or from council what thoughts they have. One of the thoughts might be, uh, Mr. Phillips, it's time for you to stop the clock. I think we're finished. Uh, but much more frequently, it is perhaps I could speak to you outside, or if we could get over the question of um, the per unit price, I have a feeling we might see if we can get somewhere or something. Uh, I think it's all right. In other words, for a mediator to give the, prob the process problem back to the parties. 
to say to the parties, it's your turn now. Being silent is a skill. And with some people, it requires more skill than with other people. Happily, I'm a Quaker, so I can sit there and be quiet for an hour. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. I enjoy it. <laughs> but you, you do place other people in a position that they might find a little bit uncomfortable. A lot of people find that a 30-second silence is fraught with tension. If so, great. You know, let's just see how it works. So asking for help and then, and then waiting to see what happens. It seems like a, a simple tool, but it can often be a very effective one. Another tool is to reload the gun. Uh, simply start again. Uh, to revisit the reason why each person wanted the mediation in the first place, often privately, to revisit what you understand their underlying interest to be, and ask them to assess whether where we are right now is serving it, whether, whether where we are right now is the best way that they think they can get what it is that they need out of this conference. Another thing to do is sometimes uh, unilaterally uh, and, uh, I mean, unilaterally meaning on your own initiative, present a bilateral restart. If somebody is at uh, 500,000 and somebody else is at 85, and we're at impasse, to propose when they're both in the room, I'd like to know whether you would be willing to start again. And this time you're at 400 and you're at 125. Or I do it separately and I say, I know they're at 500, but if they were at 400, where would you be privately? If they were at 400, where would you be? 125, I'll go into the other room and I'll say, I know they're at 75. If they were at 125, which they're not, I'm asking you, I'm not telling you what they're saying. If they were at 125, where would you be? And then ask the parties to accept that as a new bracket so that we can start negotiations again with the delta smaller, uh, Pure, purely by way of hypothesis. And the smaller delta is one that they themselves chose. Uh, he said 125, he said 400, okay? Not me. Um, so that, I'm calling that linked moves. Uh, uh, moves where uh, one party agrees to get off where they are solely because the other party has also agreed and you've been an agent for trying to figure out what those numbers are. Uh, another one, although I have to tell you, it doesn't work, uh, in my experience, it doesn't, doesn't work very, very well, is to uh, ask for a move and ask for a characterization. And I, uh, could you get off the 500 and go to something substantial? like 325, and let me characterize that as an accommodation that you made at my request. Um, and that you've authorized me to tell them that there's very little money left. Um, in other words, it, it, uh, can I characterize that as not as a move that you made in the negotiation, but rather, as a move that I requested you to make in order to determine whether the other guy can, has anywhere to go. If they don't, what have we lost? Sometimes that works. The trouble is that everybody pulls the chain of the mediator. Everybody on, the, on this conference knows everybody pulls the chain of the mediator. Somebody says, this is my, I'm never gonna go below 100. 
and then somebody agrees to settle for 95 and all of a sudden they'll go below 100 won't they so this whole business of characterizing a bid as final or characterizing a bid as next to final or something like that it's i think everybody in the room knows that we're all telling little white lies and we're going to spend some time in purgatory as a result of today's work you can change the structure uh, this is sort of like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, in my experience. But what the hell? You may, you know, as long as you're going down, you may as well go down in style. You you can uh, see if a cross caucus, in other words, having both clients alone in the room with you, or having both counsel. Sometimes I take both counsel out, and we go to the vending machines, and we just hash it out. Um, because they will be more candid with each other and far more business-like with each other if they're not in the presence of their clients, on the understanding that they trust me, that I'm not going to tell anyone what we talked about. Um, sometimes, I, I've never done it, but I've more than once heard people who did it. Uh, they pulled Daniel into the lion's den, and Daniel into the lion's den means that the CEO of the defendant you know, the senior guy for the guy who has the checkbook walks into the caucus room where there are eight or nine or ten claimants and counsel by himself without a lawyer and sits down, okay, and says, look, my board is never going to accept a number higher than 150 on this. And the trouble that I have is, is that you're north of 150. Now, would you please ask me any question you want to ask me? <laughs> because, because believe me, you know, if we're going to settle this case, it's going to be settled for this number, and I don't want to leave without being absolutely satisfied that I, in my position, okay, did everything I could to explain to you why that's so. Now, you have to have a brave and confident CEO, and you also have to have a uh, you know, plaintiffs who, who will roll with that and who will listen. I've never done that, but I've heard of it and uh, I'm, you know, I share it with you. Daniel the Lion's Den. I do do dinner in a separate venue. I, I, I do, not, not dinner, I do lunch. Sometimes I even arrange for lunch and we go to a different room. Once or twice we've actually gone to a restaurant, okay? And I, I do it when my fee is enough that I can pick up, um, which is to say not very often. <laughs> but uh, it's amazing what happens when people get back into the mediation room. If we go to a Chinese restaurant in particular, and there's that big glass rolling thing that goes around, and people, the only rule that I say for, the, for lunch is that we don't talk about the case. We can talk about the eagles. Uh, we can talk about the Mets. Uh, we can talk about Chris Christie. We can talk about all kinds of stuff, but we're not going to talk about the case. Not even in the men's room are we going to talk about the case. Then we get back, and it's a very, very different. Uh, it's a very different room. Um, and I, I, I urge you to do that. It, sometimes it costs a little money, but not a lot. Pointed bargaining advice and pointing legal analysis. I do this. Now, I, I suspect that some people find it a bit arrogant or a bit pompous, and I'm loath to do it in the, on the legal side. I'll certainly do it on the bargaining side. I will say, for instance, um, now you're at 75,000 and you're suggesting that you go up only 2077. How, why are you doing that? You know, what do you want them to do? I want them to know I'm not going up. And, um, but what I mean is, what do you expect that they, that their response is going to be? I don't care. Well, I hope you care because that's, you know, that's why we're here. If we play chess, right, we're going to move that pawn, not because we like where the pawn goes, but because we want to lure the knight out so that the rook can go here. Do you know what I mean? So what I'm asking is, play this out about three steps for me. 
what do you think is a move? Where do you want them to be? You know, what, what response do you want from them in this round of negotiation? And how do you think we can get that response from them? How can we trick their, their, their night to move to where we want the move to be? That kind of coaching, I think, is dead center what mediators ought to be doing. I think mediators ought to be bargaining coaches. Now, there are some legal personalities who really resent that. And there are, there are some you know, smart people who really resent offers to collaborate with bargaining strategy. You know, you can't control other people. And if they get resistant to it, you know, you've done your best. But I think it's a critical tool of a mediator. Approaching impasse. When people start to behave like jerks, to remind them, okay, to reverse engineer success. Is how do we get this guy to where we want this guy to be? What carrots do we use? What sticks do we use? You know, how, do, how what move should we make that now that results in the kind of move we want to see? Uh, the game of confidential listener. Uh, I did that only once and it didn't work. But a lot of people swear by it. You ask them both to write on a piece of paper, not their last, best, and final offer. And that's where a lot of people confuse this game. You're not asking for their last, best, and final. You're asking for the lowest number that the claimant will take and the highest number that the defendant will pay. And you put it in those terms, so you're not, you know, fixing their feet in cement. Uh, you read what they say, and you, the, the game is that you characterize what you read. You don't say the numbers. You don't say how far apart they are, obviously, because if you, if you say how far apart they are, then everybody knows what the other guy did. You say... Uh, I believe that you're close enough that further work uh, is warranted. Uh, you say um, you are substantially far apart, but I, uh, I, more difficult cases have been solved than this. And I suggest that everybody retire to their corners and, um, and consider strategically how we might each make another bid because I, I think it would be worth it to do that. Or you are very far apart. You are very far apart. Uh, I have no suggestions how to bridge that gap. And I would like to hear from each of you what you suggest you would like to do next. That game actually uh, has a lot of power if the people, if the parties sign on to it before you play the game and, and understand the rules of the game and listen well to what you're saying. It's called confidential listening, okay? The mediator's proposal is something I've never done. You need obviously agreed upon terms prior to doing that proposal. And there are three kinds of proposals. Uh, one of them is, would the mediator please tell us, uh, as an expert in franchise law, uh, who's right, who's wrong, and what the damages are? In other words, be a, be a quasi-arbitrator. The th second kind of mediator's proposal is, would the mediator please tell us what he thinks the likely outcome would be if this goes ahead and goes to trial and judgment? That's different. And then the third kind of mediator's proposal is, would the mediator please tell us the number that based on his work today is equally painful to both sides? In other words, what is the number that the mediator thinks is most likely to be accepted by both sides? All right. Now, those three are not the same proposal. 
but each of those stops the mediation. If you are idiot enough to go ahead and agree to do a mediator's proposal, uh, not only is the mediation not going to continue after the proposal, but in all likelihood you won't be hired again. Uh, nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to hire somebody who thinks that their case is weak. You know, nobody wants to, to hire somebody who, who has articulated the kind of doubts that a mediator's proposal uh, in, includes. It's, uh, it's, not a, it's not a situation that a mediator wants to be in. Mind you, Ken Feinberg does it all the time, all the time. And he said, Peter, I don't understand what your hesitation is. You're a good enough lawyer. Tell them. You know, tell them. It'll settle the case. They, they hired you because they believe in you, so tell them. Not, sorry, not me. I'm not going to do that. Okay. We've talked about bracketing. We've talked about the parties taking over. Uh, I don't, uh, unless we have an MOU in the matter, it actually has resolved. I don't stop. Okay. I say, okay, the, the matter is adjourned and I'll, and I'll, please don't be surprised if, you know, in a week or 10 days, uh, you get an email from me and I'd be very grateful if, if you'd respond, right? And don't worry, I'm not going to bill you for it. I, I, I just want to follow through. I want them to, un to see me as somebody who adjourns rather than quits. I think that's important for people to get the best value out of my work. Sometimes, you know, those questions like, it, it, does this law apply or doesn't it? Or was it rating or wasn't it? Uh, sometimes it's helpful to adjourn the mediation and suggest that the clients hire somebody as a rent -a judge to come in and just determine that. It only takes a few hours. It doesn't take a lot of, of either time or money. You get, you get somebody in here, and in fact, you can agree, the parties can agree either to be bound by what the judge decides on that discrete matter or not to be bound, but instead just to see the way a judge thinks about it, okay? And that at least leavens or it loosens up the, uh, the obstacle that a legal uh, distinction or a factual distinction makes. So sometimes I have said, let's just call a halt for a minute would you please, uh, you know, I'm suggesting that you hire somebody, throw 500 bucks into the bucket, each of you, just hire somebody to come in, listen to both sides for a half hour and give you a ruling that you don't necessarily have to be bound by, but at least you know, right? Uh, I realize, I'm, to my shock, that we really only have a few minutes left. So if I may, I'd like to just sort of uh, jump through the rest of our work, all right? Uh, I want to commend to you the two sources of guidance in this area that, that are, are just fabulous, thin, intensely informative books. One of them is by Dwight Golan, who is a professor at the University of, uh, of Suffolk in Boston called Mediating Legal Disputes, and it's a book of strategy. The other one is by Steve Goldberg and Jean Brett in the University of Chicago, or in Northwestern. That's an even thinner book. And it's it, pound for pound. It's, the two of them are just irreplaceable. Uh, they're not terribly expensive. The last time I saw ABA, in fact, was having a fire sale on Dwight's book. It, it, it has so much good information in it. And a lot of the analysis that I gave in the first part of tonight, I ripped off uh, from, from Dwight. If you buy the book, you'll say, oh, very rightly, you'll say, you know, Phillips uh, owes Golan half of his handsome honorarium for tonight's presentation. Let me just rip through this, okay, so that we can get out of here on time. The mediator is limited, okay? You can't settle somebody else's dispute for them. You can't create a zone of potential agreement that isn't there. If somebody doesn't want to pay 100 and the other guy owes his lawyer 105, so he can't accept 100, you can't fix that, all right? You can't determine somebody else's priorities. You can't decide 
uh, about the guy's wife that I was talking about before. That, that, that's something that you just have to accept and no amount of skill or perceptivity is going to fix that. Uh, you can't uh, you can't deal with a ra a relationships with people, especially ones that aren't in the room. You're not the one who can decide uh, who has the better legal argument. And the risks of getting into that area are, and I. I would, frankly, in my own self-assessment, if I would say what's my biggest flaw as a mediator, it's that I start owning the dispute. Um, I take it personally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, 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 and, it, and it compromises my effectiveness as a neutral. I'm supposed to be neutral. And it, it, I, I, I want this... I can see that it's so rational on both sides that it and when people behave irrationally or they start to deal with with other problems, I become frustrated and I think that somehow I'm not a good mediator. It's a real issue. The the sense of remove is, is I think critical. You can also then end up with the other party feeling as if they are subject to coercion that you are laying it on too strong. You do want to be as clear as possible, but it, as soon as you start owning the process too much, the party that you are talking to might feel as if you're yelling at them or in some way coercing them or saying that if you don't do what the mediator wants, uh, you're in some way uh, inferior or flawed or not doing the right thing, right? That then leads to my own professional concern. I need that like a hole in the head. I, you know, if I'm dealing with Chubb or with Allstate or with somebody who hires mediators a lot, what do I need from behaving in a mediation room in a way that anybody there, anybody there feels as if I'm somehow coming on too strong because I, I have my own agenda. You know what I mean? That I can't stand the fact that this thing is cratering. And I start behaving in ways that don't uh, elicit trust and that, um, that don't help my own professional reputation because I've lost the confidence either of the attorney or, or of the party. Um, this is a risk in the reaction to impasse that I caution you against. You, you might be perceived as no longer being facilitative because suddenly you think you have skin in the game. And you venture into unethical behavior, no question about it. The, the, uh, I remind you that the source of, of, uh, Ethical guidelines for lawyers uh, and for mediators is uh, promulgated not only by the American Arbitration Association and the ABA, but the entity which at that time was called SPIDER and which is now the ACR. And you can hop on to the ACR website or AAA's website or the ABA and get not only those guidelines, which are really good reading, but also um, uh, opinions that have been created either by the internal ethics committee of the ABA dispute resolution section or by courts uh, dealing with challenges to uh, mediator uh, ethics. I, Alan, can I keep going? Your mic is off. I'm not used to being so silent. Uh, we'll keep going. We'll do the last question uh, at the end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so after impasse, okay, can you call somebody up and try to help them? Uh, can you share your view that the impasse is being caused by their counsel uh, uh, making a mistake or the other counsel making a mistake uh, in a pro se situation when when the the when the pro se party is asking you what the ramifications would be. Uh, am I going to have to pay tax on this? Um, and, and, <laughs> and you start walking in there because you're trying to make sure that this deal actually closes. Um, 
that's an ethical area. That, that's an area that, and by the way, I don't mean moral. I don't mean you're a bad guy. What I mean is that you may behave in a way that doesn't assist the reputation of the profession. You know, you're, you're, you're behaving in a way that goes outside the role of a professional beautician or a professional uh, plumber or a professional mediator. It hasn't to do with whether you're a good or a bad person. It has to do with, with whether you're providing the service that you undertook to provide. Um, so those, I, I, I just want to sort of touch on those. Uh, the, this obviously is, is another thing that we could spend a whole, a whole program on of, of issues that all of us have gotten into that make us feel as if maybe we shouldn't have done what you did or maybe we want to go home and take a shower or uh, we, we know this when, when we see it. And this would be a really fun thing to have one of those in-person kind of sessions of, of people trading off things that have happened to them in the mediation room that, that they've left un, uncertain about, about whether they did the right thing. So I guess we're talking, in, in my point of view, as with, we're, we're always at balance, okay? We're always at balance because we're the advocate for the settlement, while at the same time we don't have skin in the game. And we're advising the party on bargaining or even legal um, strategies, while at the same time not having a representational capacity. <laughs> so so it, 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 it's, a, it's a needle that uh, we can certainly thread, and, and the more we find ourselves in these situations, I think the more successful we end up being, but, it, but it's one that requires diligence and a sophistication and a real sense of, I, I guess I'm calling it mediation literacy, so that you can see what's going on in the room. An impasse doesn't happen because a meteor came down and smashed the room. It happened because of decisions that the parties made for reasons that I hope now you can more transparently assess and maybe help them get over. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, Peter, uh, I am ever grateful to you for the time and efforts you took to share your thoughts and experiences with us tonight. Your presentation was enriching, to say the least. And I think a lot of uh, the ideas and uh, observations that you share can, shared can be implemented in our varied practices. I thank you again and hope you will continue to support us in the future. Thank you very much, Mitsu. And Alan, I would be remiss if I did not thank Alan for the hours you spent on getting this show on the road. You have been great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mitsu. This is, uh, this is where I think the association needs to be right now. <laughs>